Jan Stein. Join me as I do interviews with leaders in the field of artificial intelligence from across the world. We speak about the business relevance of artificial intelligence and we also speak about the future. Is it to be feared or to be embraced? Please subscribe at my website for updates on future interviews. My guest today is a global keynote speaker on artificial intelligence, a successful author in the field with several must-read books to his name. He was a journalist at the BBC and the Financial Times and now writes for Forbes. A few years ago, I read the book Pandora's Brain and realized that this is an author whose work I must follow. Joining us today is Cullum Chase. And we spoke about a range of topics that I am sure you will find informative and fascinating. We touched on superintelligence and the future of humanity and on whether machine intelligence can achieve consciousness. We spoke about capitalism, technological unemployment and the idea of universal basic income. Callum made reference to the possibility of a second renaissance and the leisure society. I had to bring in the work of George Orwell and find out more about Callum's views on a dystopian future. And lastly, Callum provides advice to aspiring technology writers. And we spoke about his future writing projects. Welcome. I'm sure we are all going to learn a lot and will be left with much to think about. Callum, it is a real great honor to have somebody like you on this show today. Um, I've read some of your books, some of them some years back, so don't ask me any questions about it. <laughs> Although <laughs> I've been left with an impression, which I guess is important. Um, we are, you write about topics that's near to my heart, which is the future, things like the singularity, um, capitalism and so forth. Uh, I read somewhere that you got interested in AI through science fiction. Is that correct? Tell us a bit more. Uh that is correct, and, and thanks for the very warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, yes, I did. Uh, I read too much science fiction as a kid, and so I always thought that artificial intelligence would arrive at some point, but I thought it would be thousands of years into the future, maybe hundreds, but probably thousands, until I read a book by Ray Kurzweil in 1999. Ray Kurzweil gets a lot of criticism um, some of which, to be honest, is justified. But he deserves an awful lot of credit for, late, for waking up a lot of people to the enormous potential impacts of AI within this century. Um, it wasn't until I read him that I took seriously the idea that uh, an artificial general intelligence and then a super intelligence might arrive this century. And that was a, an amazing eye-opening thought that you know, my son might get to see that happen, or possibly even me, um, but more likely my son. And then I started thinking about the nearer term possibilities uh, of, of, of technological unemployment and so on. Um, I retired in 2011 and uh, started reading much more about it uh, as a hobby, if you like, and then started writing books about it. And then the big bang in AI happened in 2012 when deep learning became a workable thing. And suddenly everybody else got really interested in AI as well. So I got caught up in that and it's been a fantastic journey and absolutely fascinating and it continues to get more and more interesting. You've got a journalistic background if I'm not mistaken, I think the BBC and the Financial Times you obviously write extensively on, on Forbes. Um, I'd love to get to the books um, because I think just looking at the titles and, and looking at the summary of the books they, they tell a story of maybe also how your thinking has progressed. The first book was, was a work of fiction if I'm not mistaken. So let's maybe if you would Take us through the books, how they progress, and, and maybe how your, your ideas developed. Yeah, so the first book was called, and it's called Pandora's Brain, and it's about the possibility of a, I don't want to give uh, too many spoilers in case people haven't, haven't read it, and if you haven't read it, you must. Um, yes. So it's about, the, it's about the first super intelligence on this planet. And I wrote it because at the time, at the time I started writing, which was back in, Actually, there was a first version of it in, that, I, that I wrote in 2000, which was truly terrible, but I rewrote it completely from scratch in, in, from, from 2011 onwards. And I wrote it because 
very few people were paying attention to the possibility of very advanced AI happening fairly soon. Um, and I think I published it in 2013, something like that. I've actually just finished the sequel. Uh, it's been a long time coming. And it's called Pandora's Oracle, and it takes the adventures of the, um, the protagonist of Pandora's Brain on to, to the next stage. Uh, and I'm quite pleased with that, and I hope to publish that later this year, maybe October, November, something like that. Okay. So, yeah, that was the start of the whole thing. The yeah, next one was Surviving AI, the Promise and Peril of Artificial Intelligence. Um, there's a lot of naysayers or doomsday prophets, if you would. I've always been extremely positive about this technology. I must be honest, and I'm a father of a small child. The more I think about his future, the more I read and learn, the more I tend to get a bit pessimistic, if not really worried. So let's talk about these perils of artificial intelligence, because I think there's obviously amazing things happening in business, banking, and so forth. But this technology, and this is my real interest, is how it's impacting our future, the future of our children, our view of ourselves as humans, and so forth. So what are these perils of artificial intelligence that you wrote about in that book? So surviving AI is all about the technological singularity, which is the time when we create a, an AI which, is, which, which has all the cognitive abilities of an adult human, and because computers can be enhanced and improved in ways which sadly our minds at the moment can't, uh, it goes on to become super intelligence. And so within a sh shortish period of time could be years could be weeks could be hours uh, there's a super intelligence on this planet which is a great deal smarter than the smartest human potentially millions of times smarter now that's obviously a really really big event and uh, i do think it will either be very very good for us or very very bad for us in, in the unlikely event and i do think it's an unlikely event that we create a super intelligence or we create an agi and it becomes a super intelligence in the unlikely event, we, we do that and it hates us, or it just slightly dislikes us, then we are probably going to go extinct, because we wouldn't be able to defend ourselves against something a million times more intelligent than us. You know, we're, we're a bit more intelligent than chimpanzees. And because of that, and because also of the fact that we can communicate and can collaborate in ways that, that chimps can't, there's a few hundred thousand of them, there's eight or so billion of us, and their future depends entirely on us. So if, you, if we introduce an entity to this planet which is millions of times smarter than us, I mean way more intelligent than us than, than we are above chimps, then it, our future will depend on it. it. It will hold our future in its hands. I think it's much more likely that we will, we will work very hard to make sure that the initial one, the initial superintelligence, is extremely well disposed to us. And if it is, then it's reasonable to think that it won't change that. You know, why would it? It will be smart enough to know exactly what we are, what we're about, our good sides, our bad side. So there's no reason why it should change. It, it might, but there's no reason to think it would. And I think our best bet is that we merge with it. So uh, either we all upload our minds into computers or in some other way, we become super intelligences ourselves. And it might well want the company. It might well think, that's great. There's 8 billion of them. There's one of me. Um, I'd, I'd like them to join me. It'd be more fun. I think that's an extremely likely outcome, actually. There's another possibility, well, there's lots and lots of possibilities, and I discuss a lot of them in Surviving, Surviving AI. Um, there's another possibility that it's not conscious. It never achieves consciousness. Consciousness is just something rather odd that happens to us and other animals, it seems, but for some reason machine intelligence doesn't become conscious. And it doesn't have particularly strong... Um, opinions about things. It has goals. You can't really have an, an intelligent system which doesn't have a goal as part of the definition. Um, but it doesn't have a particularly strong drive to achieve um, any kind of meaning in its own life. I'll put it like that. Um, in which case, it's essentially an, an amazingly powerful tool for us. But I think it's more likely that it would have strong drives, and hopefully those strong drives would include our great benefit. Um, so that's Surviving AI. And actually, I've just published the third edition of Surviving AI. You know, I wrote the, third edition, the first edition of both Surviving and the, the other book, which I'll talk about, um, quite a few years ago. And the AI landscape has changed a lot since then. And I've learned a lot. So the third edition of Surviving is just out in Kindle and in audio version. 
Um, and I'm really pleased with how that's shaped up. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more comprehensive. It's a lot more, uh, it's a lot better informed, a lot more thorough, I think. I think we, we don't really understand human consciousness as we should. Um, do you think AI will achieve consciousness? I, you've alluded to most likely not. And, and what that means is, is an open conversation. Um, within the singularity, do you think that's a possibility? And, and what, if so, what would that mean? Actually, no, I think, I think most likely it will be conscious. I, I suspect, and I have very little to base this on, just a hunch, that consciousness is a, an emergent consequence of, of massively high levels of intelligent processing. And so it, it will certainly have that, so it probably will be conscious. Um, so yeah, my, my hunch is more likely than not it will be conscious. And, and what an amazing thing to have a, a, a conscious superintelligence on, on the planet. Mm -hmm. Let's hope it's more like a big sister that likes us than like a, you know, sort of a Skynet machine that hates us. Yeah. Well, we hope it, it doesn't turn to it. I sometimes think, you know, if you look at humanity, and again, I'm, I'm positive about the good that we can do and have been doing, but even if you look at where we are in the world today, where there's still genocide and, and just all kinds of evil things happening, I sometimes think we haven't evolved all that much over the last two or 3,000 years. We just became more savvy and we have better technology. So I wonder if we reproduce that base human nature in this kind of technology, what it would mean for us. So for the good, but most likely for the for evil. I don't know. We'll have to see, but it'll be interesting. Yeah, well, I tend not to think of humans in terms of good and bad. Uh, our, our, the outcomes of what we do can be good or bad. Um, I, I think it's a bit unhelpful to, to ask, are we altruistic or evil? Are we good or bad? We collaborate and we're tribal and that's not going to change anytime soon we tend to highly approve of the people who are in our tribe and highly disapprove of anybody who's outside our tribe now what the history of civilization is in one from one perspective is the history of the broadening of those tribes so when we were hunter gatherers or foragers our tribe probably consisted of a family maybe two three families a bit like a, a tribe of chimps. And then we started to create villages and then towns and then cities and then countries and then supranational organizations. For a lot of people, they consider their tribe to be the whole of humanity. Indeed, the whole of sentient life in the universe. That's relatively recent. You know, in the medieval ages, there weren't too many people who saw things like that. So I think we've made a great deal of progress in expanding our tribe and I think that is the, the, the way of the future. And another thing I'd say about humans, we, we like to think that we're a, a violent or, or dangerous species, but actually there is no other carnivorous species which can gather more than a dozen or two members in one place without starting to kill each other. Chimpanzees and other great apes, they, um, they spend a lot of time grooming each other. And the main purpose of that is to say, don't worry, I'm not going to kill you. We don't do that. We walk past strangers on crowded city streets, and there are millions of people in those, in those cities. We don't shoot each other. We don't kill each other. We do do more damage than any other species, but that's because we've got better tools, and there's so many of us. So we give ourselves a hard time. We're actually, I think, less violent than most species, other than you know herbivores and so on, who, who don't do too much, don't get involved in too much violence at all. But compared with carnivores, which is the, the relative comparative group, we're, we're actually less violent. So we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. Now, will a superintelligence take after our more progressive side or our less progressive side? A lot of people think that, that a more civilized approach uh, regarding your tribe as being the widest possible group is, is kind of goes alongside increases in intelligence. And that might, turn out, that might well turn out to be true. I, I should have mentioned the biggest job humanity has century, is to make sure that the first super intelligence whatever else really likes humans and understands us better than we understand ourselves or at least doesn't act on bad understandings of us you know it, we, we might well ask it to do something which we could later regret unintended consequences so the most important job of humanity this century is to make sure the first super intelligence really really likes us and knows how to benefit us which is quite a big ask. Yes. 
The next one is the economic singularity and the death of capitalism. Now, if we think about the workforce of tomorrow, think of the future of our children. Um, look, I have my views about capitalism. Well, that's philosophical. We need some scotch for that one. <laughs> but uh, so to <laughs> take us take us through that with the economic singularity. So we, will we end up in a with a so-called useless class in a few years? In other words, mass unemployment because we can't retrain people. What did yeah. you argue in that in that book? So I wrote The Economic Singularity later, and it is about, unsurprisingly, about the economic singularity. So I, I see this century as being the century of two singularities. Somewhere in the next 30 to 40 years, we'll have the economic one, which is the arrival of technological unemployment. And then later, maybe 70 years, maybe later, we'll have the technological one. Um, I've actually changed my views on the economic singularity a fair bit. And I've, again, just finished the third um, edition of that, and I've just posted the Kindle version to Amazon, it'll take a few days to get there, and then the audio book will come later in a month or two, or in white two. Um, I used to think, I didn't see how capitalism could survive it, <clears throat> survive technological unemployment, and now I do think it can. I am a capitalist, I've, I've spent 30 years in business. I, I, when I was a journalist, uh, I worked for the BBC, the, the, the kind of prevailing ethos of the BBC is that, that capitalism is probably fairly bad, but they're not gonna do anything about it. Um, and I think that's completely wrong-headed. Capitalism and technology has converted the world from being a pretty rotten place to be a human being prior to, say, 1700, unless you were an aristocrat or a king or a queen, uh, to being a brilliant place. Most people's lives today are better than kings and queens' lives 100 years ago. Um, and that's because of mostly of capitalism and, and technology. So there is a lot of debate about whether technological unemployment will happen. A lot of people think that machines will never get good enough to replace us in all work or that we'll always find things that they can't do. I think if you take the idea of exponential growth in the power of computers seriously, it's hard to sustain that view. Uh, assuming Moore's law or something like it continues, and there's a, there's a saying that every 18 months, there's twice as many people saying Moore's law has ended. Um, that's the meta Moore's law. And they're wrong. It's still going. It's definitely going to go on for 10 more years and may well go for quite a bit longer. And assuming it does, then long story short, in 30 years time, we'll have machines which are a million times more powerful than the machines we have today. I struggle to see how they won't do pretty much everything that we do for money today and could do for money, including jobs which require empathy and therefore would you, you would think require consciousness. Most jobs which seem to require consciousness actually generally don't. They require a, a simulacrum of it. So I do think that in 30 years or so, Humans will not be able to earn money in jobs. However, I think the upshot of that could be really good. Uh, I don't think meaning is going to be a big problem. It's a problem, but not a big problem. The problem is money. How do we create an economic system where there are some people still working, probably, um, but most people can't work for money. So they need another way to get money. And I think we, people talk about universal basic income. It has lots of problems. The biggest one is the word basic. We have to do something much better than make everybody poor. We've got to make everybody rich, or at least very comfortable, like a middle-class American lifestyle. And I think we can do that because, and this is what I've increasingly come to realize, automation is part of the process of the economy of abundance developing. The economy of abundance is an economy where the price of all the goods and services that you need for a really good standard of living are almost zero. Not completely zero, because... Firstly, you can't make material things for, for nothing. There's always a, a raw material cost, there's energy cost. Um, but, and also because we shouldn't want to, because um, it shouldn't be possible to just build a house for free. You should actually have to uh, choose your house and the market should apply to the availability of houses and, and other things. So I think that we can arrive at something that I increasingly call the the, the, the situation of fully automated luxury capitalism. I think that's the end, that's the goal. To do that, we need automation because we need humans who are expensive to be taken out of the production process of all goods and services. We need very cheap energy and that will come because uh, solar, solar power generation is getting cheaper, not an exponential rate, but it's getting much, much cheaper. And because AI will increasingly make all the production processes very efficient. So if we can get to an economy of abundance, then the income that is being earned in the economy can be shared out among everybody else 
without being an onerous burden on the people who are generating the income, whether that's corporations or rich people or governments or whoever it is, um, then everybody gets to do whatever they want. And that's a brilliant world. That's a world we should aim for. It, we could have a second renaissance. It's the leisure society that we've been promised for a long time has never arrived. So I talk about that a lot in, in, the, in the third edition of The Economic Singularity, which, as I say, is coming out shortly. It's quite a complicated story, and there's a lot of controversy about it because I think the conventional wisdom at the moment is still, it's the Luddite fallacy, and we've been here before, automation doesn't cause unemployment. And it's true that in the past it hasn't, but of course what's happened in the past isn't a terribly reliable guide to the future, because if it was, we wouldn't be able to fly. Mm -hmm. The next book, I think it was about two years ago, you speak about the two singularities. Is that still playing on the, the technology and the economic side of things? In other words, yeah, well, the, work? yeah the, the, the book, The Two Singularities, is simply the, the, the mashup of, the, of surviving AI and the economic singularity. Um, I did that for an academic publisher because I wanted to have a book published by an academic publisher. I've been published by uh, traditional publishing, a trade publisher, uh, Random House. Uh, I published a book with them in 1999 been self-published quite a bit I do enjoy that and I wanted to tick off the third box which is an academic publisher um, the trouble with that that book is it's quite big <laughs> putting those two to get books together it makes quite a big book so I haven't done that with the, with the self-published versions mm -hmm. and then last year was I think you were the editor of the stories of 2045 um, again I think most likely expanding even further on some of these these things what is new in, in that most recent book and obviously I think being editor is more collaborative effort but what what is new in that book that didn't maybe appear in some of your previous works so um, well I congratulate you and you've done your research you've done your homework extremely well um, yes so 2045 is is a collection of stories by a whole range of people um, I have a group of friends who get together and discuss uh, the economic singularity and it's called the economic singularity club and we all got together and wrote stories and i tried to persuade everybody to produce one uh positive story and one dystopian story it's actually easier to write dystopian stories so i had to push quite hard to get the positive ones and they're very creative and there's lot there are lots of great ones lots of fun stories in there um all sorts of different ways of looking at what might happen by 2045 um and i, I contributed four to it one uh, which is called The Lucky Generation, is, a, is the shortest version of my view of how the economic singularity could turn out well. So if anybody's looking for a really short explanation of how that could, that could go well, uh, that story in, in that book is, is, the, is the best place to go. I found, I'm a big fan of Orwell, and I wonder if he was alive today, which is maybe a silly thing to say because the world is so different. But if you had to write or contribute to that book, I wonder, <laughs> what do you think he would have uh, written about? Just maybe expanding, because Big Brother is watching and maybe we'll watch even more, and the thought police potentially with, uh, um, by, you know, implants and all that. Um, so a lot of, when we speak about the future and, and this technology, a lot of people reference Orwell. I don't, do you think that's relevant? Or do you think it's a kind of a bygone era to think like that? What are your views on, on Orwell and the future? Well, of course, uh, there's, there's, I can't remember who said it. In fact, maybe it's one of those quotes that nobody has found the attribution. But um, science fiction is often thought to say more about your life today than uh, about the future. And, and Orwell wrote 1984 in, in the year 1948. And he was sounding a warning about communism. He was saying communism looks great. Because, it, because back then, we didn't, they didn't know what Stalin was up to. They didn't know about the gulags and so on. Um, and I think they probably didn't know about the famines in China, the, the deliberate famines. Um, so he was warning about what that was likely to evolve into, and he was right, pretty much. Um, and no, it, you know, certainly not an irrelevance. I mean, uh, the the technologies we have now would make Big Brother Big Brother jealous. We now have technologies to track people in much more intimate ways than Big Brother had. You know, Big Brother had the jackboot of violence. That's available to governments too. Uh, so it, it's a terribly relevant book. It, it's, a, it's a signpost to a world where things go really badly wrong. What would Orwell think of today's world? I, I suspect that unlike us, he would realize how lucky we are 
you know, he would come from 1948 and, and look around and think, goodness, <clears throat> you people are all plutocrats. You're all richer than the richest person <laughs> when, when I was alive. Uh, I think he'd think, you know, the world has got a lot better. Um, many fewer starving people and so on as a, as a proportion of the world's population. Um, but I'm sure also there'd be things that would appall him. Um, I've read his books about his time in Spain as well, because uh, I, I spent a lot of time in Spain. Um, and he was a man who was well able to see the negative sides of life, and I'm sure he would find lots of bad things to write about today's world. But I think the first thing that would strike him is how much our lives have improved. You know, our health span, our, our quality of life in many ways, uh, our, our access to knowledge and information. I think he'd be astonished by Google search and Wikipedia. As a writer, I think you'd think that was truly amazing. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Colm, the, the, obviously there's the, the writing, um, there's the Singularity Club, there's, uh, you do, it seems like a significant amount of speaking globally. Um, what else do you do? It's a silly question to ask because that's already a heck of a lot. Do you do um, advisory work, consulting work, things like that? I don't really. Um, I mean, if somebody needs some advice, I'm happy to offer it, but I don't do professional consulting anymore. I spent 15 or so years as, as a management consultant. Mm -hmm. um, I love the writing I do. I love the speaking. The speaking is great, and it's such a shame for me uh, that that has all completely stopped, obviously, with, with COVID. I'm, I'm hoping it will come back. In fact, I'm, I'm confident it will come back, but it might. And I get to do that partly uh, as a speaker, um, but also I spend, as I say, a lot of time. And I want to do more travel writing in the future as well. Mm. What about um, aspiring writers in the field of technology? I think often technologists are what I just call propeller heads, so very smart people, but they struggle to tell a story maybe. Um, I, I'm more of a, I have a sales background um, and... I often would not bring the very technical people to the first few meetings because it will be immediately about tools and frameworks and things like that and not necessarily about the business problem. So I think it serves me not to be very technical. Um, but if, if people who are, well, whether they're not technical or not, but people in the field of technology, if they want, if they aspire to write more, would, do you suggest maybe a blog um, or to, to write for some, somebody like Forbes? How do they get to actually writing a book? I'd like to end off our conversation with that because I, and are books still relevant? That's a comment I had the other day is why do you do books? Just do videos because people don't read books anymore, but I read a lot. So I'm sure a lot of other people read as well. Um, how do we get into this writing thing and become successful with it? What would your tips be there? Um, two very simple things. One, read. Two, write. You can't be a writer unless you read a lot. I mean, you can, but you're not likely to be a very good writer. Um, if you've never been in the habit of reading and you want to be a writer, then you may have the wrong ambition. Um, it, it may be possible, but it's going to be hard. And write. I think most successful writers, and I suppose I'm a semi-successful writer, um, you know, I'm not J.K. Rowling, that's for sure. <laughs> um, most successful writers probably just always have written. And I didn't really know this about myself, but looking back on it, I've always written. I wrote capacious diaries, which would be awfully boring to read now, but I wrote a lot about, you know, things that were going on in the world around me. And whenever I've traveled, I've written a lot about the places I've been to. And so if you want to be a writer, firstly, write. And there's loads of ways to put your writing into the world. As you say, a blog, um, you know, that you can do tweet storms, um, uh, I dare say you can write for Medium. I don't know how, how you get onto Medium, but I dare say it's, uh, that's, that's a thing. Um, and how do you write a book? Well, it's a bit like eating an elephant. You do it in bits. Um, you know, don't, don't think that you're going to finish it in a week. You're not. It's going to take months. Um, and there are apparently two types of writers. There's planners and pantsers. So planners lay out the book in advance in great detail. And I'm a planner. I have a spreadsheet whenever I start writing a book. So I know pretty much how it's going to work out. If it's a novel, I know what the ending is going to be and I know how all the characters are going to evolve. Although interestingly, when I write fiction, the characters disobey me <laughs> sometimes. I've, I've found an interesting thing that I have favorite characters in my novels and they always kill themselves. <laughs> I don't know why. I had a, a character which I really liked called Ivan in the first book and he just insisted on being killed <laughs> after the first third of the book. That was very annoying. Um, 
and then the other type of writers are, are pantsers, and they just start and see where it takes them. And I don't suppose that either is right or wrong. Uh, there's lots of different ways of writing. But if you want to be a writer, I suppose, yeah, read, write, and uh, listen to other writers. So there are all sorts of organizations for writers. Um, there's an organization called Ally, uh, the Association, uh, can't remember what it stands for, A-double-L-I, very good organization for independent writers. But there's hundreds of, of, of websites and support groups for writers. Um, just dive into that world and learn as much as you can about it. And it, it is great fun, slightly terrifying. A blank page is always slightly terrifying. Um, I suppose the thing I would sum up, the way I would sum up writing is, I don't really like writing, but I love having written. That's good advice, thank you. What books can we expect in the next year or two or three? Uh, give us a, a glimpse, if you don't mind. Sure, uh, very happy to. Um, so. As I say, the um, Surviving AI 3rd Edition is out. Economic Singularity 3rd Edition is coming out. Uh, Pandora's Oracle, the sequel to the novel, is coming out later because um, I've been busy during lockdown. Um, and I'm working on a book with a good friend called AI for Business, which is about the practical things that business people should be doing with AI in the, in the short good. term. That may come out later this year, not sure. And I'm working on my first travel book, which is about um, exploring Andalusia, which is the part of Spain I live in. And I have a book, my next project after that, because you can never be too busy, <laughs> is um, it's going to be a collection of articles I'm writing for Forbes, which are uh, uh, reviews of how AI will, in will impact individual sectors. So I've written about how it will affect professional services, how it will affect journalism. I'm doing one on healthcare at the moment. Uh, one on property. So I'm writing about how, how AI will affect all sorts of different sectors in the next kind of between five and 20 years. Um, and so I'll put all those together in a book sometime, exactly. probably next year. Well, we look forward to it, uh, Colin. We, um, I'm going to add the links to the various books to this video. I really encourage people to, to read them. Um, there's a lot of, if I may say, a lot of intelligence behind it. It's not just scaremongering or dystopian stories. It's real stuff, well thought through and well researched. So it is worth reading. Um, I appreciate your time so much and also for the advice you've given us about writing. And I do look forward to when you have time in the future to have another conversation.